Welcome to The Creative Influencer, where we discuss all things creative with an emphasis on influencers. The Creative Influencer is hosted by John Pfeiffer. John is an entertainment attorney in Santa Monica, California, who represents influencers and other creatives. This is Episode 9 of the second season of the Creative Influencer Podcast. Today, we interview Congressman Will Hurd. Will is the representative for Texas's 23rd Congressional District and has been described as one of the leading voices on technology in Congress. He serves on the House Committee on Appropriations, the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, as well as several subcommittees. Prior to running for public office, Will was an undercover agent in the CIA serving in India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Will sits down with us to discuss how social media is affecting both the intelligence community and the government generally. Will shares with us memories from his time in the CIA, as well as his viral live-streamed road trip across the country with Beto O'Rourke. Stay tuned for some great stories. I am joined today by Congressman Will Hurd. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be out here. Uh, you are the congressman for Texas's 23rd Congressional District. That's right. And that includes San Antonio? San Antonio all the way to El Paso down to Eagle Pass. It's, um, tr- it's 29 counties total, 820 miles of the border. It takes 10 and a half hours to drive across it um, at 80 miles an hour, which is actually the speed limit in most of the district. And it is um, larger than 26 states. It's roughly the size of the state of Georgia. So San Antonio is 50% of the population. You know, most people don't realize San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the country. And on the other end is El Paso, uh, which is, I think, the 15th largest, um, in, in 15, 15th or 17th uh, largest city. And in the middle, more cows than people. But it's well. It's, I'm from Nebraska, so I really <laughs> you know cows. you understand yeah. that you understand that. So, but yeah, it's my hometown. It's where I grew up. And you have been described as the leading voice on technology, or one of the leading voices on technology in Congress. Bar is very low. Um, <laughs> you know, we start with that. There's there's only eight of us that have um, technical degrees. There's a there's a handful more that had been involved in businesses that had some technical background. But my degree is in computer science. And when I got out of the CIA, I helped start a cybersecurity company. And so figuring out how you protect people from digital threats, which is only increasing. Um, and we'll get to the CIA. We'll get sure. to the cybersecurity. Because sure. now you are on two committees, serve on two committees currently and a number of subcommittees. Yep. Uh, the Appropriations Committee, which is the, 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 the committee that funds, funds the, the government. Um, I, I work specifically on transportation, housing, and urban development. That's one uh, subcommittee. And the other subcommittee is um, VA and military construction. So when you think about the military, we fund it two different ways. All the ships, boats, and guns is one committee. And then making sure that our men and women that are serving on our bases has houses is another committee. And so I work on that in, in a, as well as the Veterans Affairs Committee. And you're also on the subcommittee on intelligence, modernization. And readiness. I, I am um, the intelligence committee. You know, we we all do a lot of work, but one of the things that we're trying to do is is make sure. You know, when I was in the CIA, you know, um, social media was just starting to become popular, and so that's changed the game. Um, we're also looking at security clearances. Why does it take nine months? in a quick to do a security clearance. Oh, and by the way, um, does the person that lived three houses down from you really know that much about you? Or can I find all that information via social media or, or online, the, on, yeah. online, right? And so these are some of the questions uh, when it comes to, to modernization, making sure we have the, the right intelligence community. So the most important question, Mac or PC? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've just recently switched back to a Mac, to a, to a PC, excuse me. Um, when I was, when I was in the private sector, I got put on a, 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 a Mac, um, but now I'm back to now I'm back to the PC. And do you cover the camera on your computer? I do. I do. Old habits die hard. Um, you know, I, I still I still see if there's anybody following me from the grocery store. So you know, did anybody I'm, follow you here? This no, morning? I'm uh, we, I'm clean. I'm clean. <laughs> no surveillance today. Uh, I want to ask you your thoughts on a couple of political issues, but we'll come back to that sure. towards the end. Um, 
as I was getting ready for this interview, I was telling my son that I was going to interview you. Mm -hmm. And he said, so are you going to send the questions to Will in advance? And I said, I don't have to. He was on uh, Bill Maher. And he did okay. <laughs> yeah, I can handle it. Look, if I can't answer questions now, then guess what? You're crummy at your job. All right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so you kind of you, you, you spilled the beans, but it's impressive enough that you're a congressperson, mm -hmm. congressman. But at least for my money, it's equally impressive that you were in the CIA. Uh, you are former CIA. I am. What was your path to the CIA? Sure. So, and, and just I want to interject just because I had Rodney Farron on, mm -hmm. uh, and I looked it up. It was season two, episode one, and I asked him how he got to the CIA, and he said I called him, <laughs> <laughs> and he gave the number. That, that's that's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, that's great. Uh, so so Rodney and I know each other through our time together in the private sector at, at a company called Crumpton Group, and Hank Crumpton, um, who was a senior CIA officer as well. When he was 12 years old, he sent a letter to the CIA, and the CIA responded back to him, which I thought was pretty amazing. Well, my story is – so I, growing up in San Antonio, I went to Texas A&M, which is um, you know, one of the uh, top three largest university, public universities in, in the country so I'm on the outskirts of Houston, Texas. And I, I read where you got into Stanford. I did. I did get into Stanford, um, and I, I I knew I wanted to do computer science because of my experiences. And Stanford doesn't in, do computer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they did, but I, but I got I got on the A uh, and M's campus, and there was something. I, and and I applied to A and M because it was my backup school to, in case I didn't get to Stanford. And I did get to Stanford. I got scholarships to go, but I was on Texas A and M's campus and, and fell in love with it and said, "This is the place I should be." And, and I'm glad I made that decision. But I, I'm, a, I'm a freshman computer science major. I had never been outside of Texas. And I'm walking across campus and I see a sign that says to take two journalism classes in Mexico City for $425. And I had 450 bucks in my bank account from working at the computer lab in the, in the athletic dorm. And I said, I'm going to Mexico. So <laughs> I um, was in Mexico for the summer. See, in California, they do. We're going to Tijuana. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, this, was, this is a little bit deeper. This is a little bit deeper into Mexico. But it was a – I fell in love being in another culture. I thought it was cool seeing things I only read about in books. So I decided to add international studies as a minor. In my first class in international studies – I had a guest lecturer. So this was right when uh, George H.W. Bush just created his school at, at the, the Bush School at Texas A&M. And so they had a guest lecturer, former senior CA guy, and he told the most amazing stories. He was like this old school cold warrior. And he was – when he left the CIA, he was in essence the head of all the counterintelligence. So counterintelligence is trying to stop the spies from spying on us, right? He was involved in, in, in finding Aldrich Ames. Um, he had spent time in Russia. He was the head of our station in Vienna. You know, back in the 80s, Vienna was like true spy versus spy. Um, he was also a uh, chief of station in Mexico City. Again, the Russians in, in the, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s were always trying to do stuff in, um, in Mexico because of the proximity, obviously, to the United States. So that was another hotbed of place. And this guy told these stories. I was just like blown away. And I went to his office the next day, and I'd never done that, never gone to a professor's office, knocked on his door and said, tell me more. And that began my interest in the CIA. And so when it was, when it was time for me to graduate, I applied, uh, put my application in, did the interviews, and got accepted. So it was um, – I started when I was 22. What year was that? Uh, so this would have been, this would have been um, a 2000. So I started – October of 2000. And it was crazy. And I read I, something about on your way to, to, to first, my first, my first day, right? Like I, 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 this was, you know, everybody forgets this is back in 2000. This, you still had regional cell phone plans, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I drove my car from San Antonio to Washington, DC, and I was going to stop and see friends along the way. And I'm at a gas station pumping gas and, um, the coal, the USS coal, had just been attacked by Al Qaeda. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, man, I'm getting ready to join the CIA. I wonder if I'm going to ever know anything about that. 
And after I go through the initial training, I ended up. By the working. way, just Kirby, can you tell me who killed JFK? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. Um, Sorry you know, to interrupt in, you. No, in, in, in CIA 101, which is literally a class. Yeah. Okay. So it's everybody who's involved in the CIA. So I, I was on the operations side. So I was a dude in the back alleys at four o'clock in the morning collecting intelligence. Then you have the analytical side, which are which is doing all source analysis. So they're bringing diplomatic information, uh, press information, stuff from the NSA and, and putting it all together. And then you have the, the technical folks, you know, I would say it's Q from, um, from James Bond, you know, those yeah. folks. And one of the things, one of the reasons the CIA is so great is our information, right? You keep track of everything. And they always say, look, don't ask, don't query the database of where is the Lindbergh baby, you know, <laughs> or what's in Area 51 you because you're, you're keeping track of everything, right? And then and then you're like, they put that in your head and you're like, do we know where the Lindbergh baby is? Um, and so, so yeah, so that was one of the ones, don't, 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 ask. don't ask who killed JFK. Um, but it was... It was it was a great gig, but but so that day. So I'm sorry. No, no, no. no that yeah, day yeah. Um, on the USS Cole after CIA 101, mm-hmm. I ended up um, working on the Yemen account, and mm-hmm. and so I helped and I spent time in Yemen. I was in Sanaa, um, helping to support our, our operations there. So my career began ultimately with Al Qaeda, and, and then and 9/11, 9/11, happened. 9/11 happened. Yeah. So how did that change your career? So it, it changed. I think it changed all of us because. Um, so so the counterterrorism center. This is the entity that was tracking you know terrorists around the world. Bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, had been known to a lot of. You know, he was number one. He was number one target. Number one priority. But he wasn't a household name. Right. And and while the CTC was involved and in, 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 in active, and they had been active from 17 November, this was a, a Greek group, um, it was not the main focus of the CIA. The CIA was still classic um, a strategic intelligence, you know, in, in um, you know, major power, you know, operations, right? And um, after 9-11, all that changed and counterterrorism became uh, the, the major focus um, of the organization. And on September 12th, um, 2001, I got a phone call at four o'clock in the morning saying, show up at the basement of the old headquarters building. Um, because we need your help. And, and I was one of the early folks in what was called the Counterterrorism Center Special Operations Division. We were the unit that was based in Langley that helped oversee the prosecution of the war in Afghanistan. And I always remind folks, we've been at war for 17, 18 years, right? And the toll that that takes on people, and there's a lot of people that have gone into these war zones seven, eight, nine times. And... On September 12th, everybody believed that this was just the beginning. Everybody thought that there was going to be another major attack like what we saw happen to the Pentagon, what we saw happen um, to the 9-11, uh, to, the, to the Twin Towers in, in, in New York City. And guess what? <clears throat> there were number of operations and plans and groups that were trying to do something of that magnitude. And the reason there hasn't been another attack like what we saw on September 11th is because the men and women in the intelligence community, our diplomatic corps, our military and federal law enforcement are still operating as if it's September 12th, 2001. When you were, when you first joined, Mm -hmm. how many people knew that you were in the CIA? Outside of the CIA. So Did mom um, and dad know? My mom and dad knew and my sister knew. Uh, well, my sister didn't know right away. Uh, my sister ended up being my emergency contact. Um, and my, my brother is still upset to this day that I that didn't he didn't know. But my brother has a big mouth and he can't keep a secret. <laughs> so uh, they knew. And that was that was pretty much it. And then you had um, the, the professor at AM that helped me. And then at the time, uh, Bob Gates, you know, uh, our former, former, CIA, yeah. former CIA, he was the interim head of the Bush School. He ended up becoming the president of Texas A&M University, and then he was Secretary of Defense. 
And he was at A&M at the time that I was applying and I had gone and talked to him and got his counsel. So, so they're the only ones, uh, if I remember right, that, that knew yeah. that I was going in. Most people thought I was going to work for the State Department. Okay. So that was the cover. Yeah, my cover was State Department. And guess what? I did a lot of work for the State <laughs> Department. I, I think I still hold the record of CIA officers that's written more State Department cables than everybody else because I actually had responsibilities for the State Department. Right. And so I had to do uh, that work. And so um, the only thing that we, you were really concealing is you know who ultimately paid your money. And part of it is you want to protect other people. It is, it is hard. It is hard. Um, carrying secrets. It is hard. Um, you know, you don't want people to have to lie for you, right? And, and part of it was um, to protect my cover, to protect the folks that I was working with. And, and who you work for was one tool in your toolkit to keep you safe, but also to keep the, the agents that's giving you intelligence safe. And I want to ask where you were stationed, but when you, you were undercover for mm-hmm. a period of time. I, I was undercover for my entire career. When you were undercover... How many people knew you were undercover outside of the CIA? Did mom and dad know? Um, so, so yes. So, so mom and dad knew and my sister knew where I actually worked. But if they got asked, you know, I work at the State Department, okay. right? And, and so, so, so that's all they knew. You know, other things that I was doing, you don't know. You're not keeping it from your, your fellow government employees, right? right? People in the embassy – basically know what you're doing because your behavior and your patterns look very different from everybody else. Um, and so, so again, uh, the, it, it is a way to, cause, cause what the reason you do that is those local governments, right? The, the FBI and the CIA equivalent of those other countries are trying to figure out who those, who those intelligence officers are. And over time, uh, you do things that look different from everybody else, uh, so your cover is just one tool to keep you safe, uh, but it's an important one. Uh, so you mentioned it earlier, but social media was just starting at mm-hmm. the time. Were you – just being in the CIA, are you allowed to be on social media? Uh, now you are. And now, now if you're not, it would be weird, right? So, <laughs> Well, that's the, so, that's the problem is somebody that's not on social media is like – What's yeah. up? So in in uh, what Facebook got started in, in two thousand six, right? Um, Twitter was oh nine, and and I left. My last day was in August of two thousand and nine, and at that point, um, I think we weren't allowed to be on social media, but it was still where I, I, I forget when. Uh, Facebook opened up to people that weren't in colleges, right? You had to be, you had to have a college, college email. you had to have a .edu email in order to do this, right? And so, so it was fine. It, it was, it was still not as ubiquitous as it is now. Um, uh, but, but now you, you have to, and, and look, that, that creates. So, so when you have this access to social media, you, people can learn more about you. And, and so, so, so having to protect yourself, having to show, make sure that your social media looks like, you know, whatever your regular cover person, is, yeah. a regular person. Is, Somebody that works is, for the state department. Absolutely. is important. But also, it gives you opportunities, right? Because I wish the people that I was trying to recruit, if I had access to all their social media and see what they were doing and what they were liking, like what they like to do, right? Um, that, it, 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 it increases your surface area of attack. Defensively, but also on, on offense. And, and look, in one, in one operation, I knew a guy went to, went to this one store, usually at the same time every day, at the same time, same, same day. And so because I wanted to meet him, guess what I would do? You'd be at the store at the I'd same time. I'd be at that door, at that store at the same time every day. And, and so uh, that's what we call a bump. Where you where you go and you make contact with someone for the first time in order to start developing a relationship, and you know if with social media my ability uh, to figure out where people go and to increase you know my chances of, of bumping into them um, would would increase significantly. Uh, where did you? I 
previewed it a second ago, but where did you serve? Sure. So I, I was in D.C. for two years. Um, part of that was at the, what I used to call our super secret CAA training facility called The Farm. Now it's on Google Maps. Um, <laughs> uh, two years and ago, Rodney outed the phone number, so yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently everybody, anybody can get the phone number. But um, he said he went to the to the to just the phone directory. Yeah. That, no, I, I, I believe, look, you, you, part of it is you want to be accessible, right? Right, right. Um, two years in India. I did two years in Pakistan. I did two years in New York City doing interagency work, and then a year and a half in Afghanistan where I managed all of our undercover operations. And I read somewhere or heard on an interview where you got the local discount when you were in Pakistan. <laughs> right. At the right. bazaar, they would give you the local discount. Sure. So for your listeners who don't know, my, my father's black, my mother's white, and my skin color is, um, you know, blends in with a lot of different cultures. And when I was in, in Pakistan, I would wear, a, 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 you know, local clothes, you know, had a, had a beard. And my Urdu was good enough at the time where I could, you know, get the locals discounts. And the, how big was shops. your beard? How long was your beard? Uh, it depends, you know, like, like it, it depends on what you're going for, right? Sometimes if you wanted to look more Egyptian, it would be a little bit more tailored and pointy. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, it, w- it was just long and unruly. Um, in, in Pakistan, it was depending on, you know, uh, well, what 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 I was trying to do, how long it was, and, but it was a full. You're beard. a tall guy, a big guy. Mm-hmm. Did anybody ever say you're bigger than the average Pakistani? Well, look, everybody would think I would just be like the biggest Pakistani <laughs> they ever seen. But 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 after after you know nine or ten exchanges in 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 Urdu, that was when my my Urdu started breaking down, right? And and uh, and that's when, you know, my, uh, you know, I have a I have a hint. Everybody always laughs. Like, you don't have a, a Texas accent. When I get tired, you know, my draw comes out. comes out and you have a the hint of a, of an accent comes in. So, uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a good time. I love being in Pakistan. Um, so, spoiler alert, you ultimately left. Yeah. What prompted you to leave the CIA? So... In addition, I always say, look, my, my job, I chased Al-Qaeda and other terrorists all around the world. I stopped Russians from stealing our secrets. I put nuclear weapon proliferators out of business. Um, but I also had to brief members of Congress. And I probably briefed close to 200 members, let, uh, R's, D's, men, women, all 50 states. And I was pretty shocked by the caliber of our elected officials. And uh, one of the stories, the one that finally, the straw that broke the camel's back, I was in, I was in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, one, one evening, a bomb goes off in front of the embassy, kills a local guard, takes out um, 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 a big section of our perimeter defenses. And my unit was responsible trying to figure out what happened, right? And, and that was three o'clock in the morning, I think. And so we we conduct a, a, a couple dozen operations in a single day, which is a lot. And later that evening in the embassy, the a, a congressional delegation of members of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, we call that HIPSI, um, were at the embassy in Kabul to get a briefing on operations going on in Afghanistan. So people that should know what's going on. People that should know what's going on. And so I go into... And our, our standard operating procedure was to be in business casual, right? Slacks, you know, button up, sport coat. And I kind of go in in tactical gear because I'd been, I'd been, you know, working all day trying to figure out what happened uh, with this explosion. And as I'm walking into the, the briefing room, I overhear this one member of Congress say, is the CIA going to, um, conclude this quickly so we can get to the bazaar to buy rugs, right? <laughs> So I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed already. We go in, and, and it gets to my part of the briefing, and I'm explaining. Uh, I, I, I'm explaining the general dynamics of what's happening, and one of the members who had been on the committee for I think five or six years said, asked the question, "Why was Iran not supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan the way Iran was supporting some of these other militia groups?" In Iraq. This is like 2007, 2008 timeline, by the way. And I start explaining the Sunni Shia divide. And this member of Congress raises his hand. He goes, Heard, um, what's the difference between a Sunni and a Shia? 
And I'm thinking he's getting ready to make a really inappropriate joke. And, right, right. and who am I to deny him this opportunity? And my response was, I don't know, Congressman, what's the difference? And I'm getting ready to go, you're, but you're I'm the bum, Ed McMahon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Ed McMahon, exactly, right? You know, let him have his moment. And his face goes bright red, didn't know that difference in Islam. And, 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 and you alluded to this. I don't expect everybody to be able to go into the history of the split of Islam, you know, with Ali and who was the who was the person that was supposed to to replace the Prophet Muhammad. I, I don't expect all that. Right? I, I don't expect everyone to understand, you know, what is Hezbollah, what is Hamas, what is Al Qaeda, what is Jaishi Muhammad. But what I do expect is if you're sitting on the intelligence committee who's making decisions on billions of, of, of taxpayer dollars and how that's going to be spent. Uh, you're making decisions and doing oversight on important operations. You should know the basics of why the difference between Sunni and Shia matters and how that impacts the global war on terrorism. And so I was appalled. And I had friends that had run races um, across the country, uh, uh, you know, before this incident, they had said, have you ever thought about District 23? And I'm like, what's District 23? <laughs> and at that moment, I said, okay, I'm going to do this, right? Because I, 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 I wanted to stay in the agency um, for my career. I loved the job, but I thought I was going to be able to help the intelligence community in a different way. So I moved from Afghanistan back to my hometown of San Antonio and ran for Congress, and lost. Yeah. And lost. <laughs> I lost a runoff by 700 <laughs> votes. Right? Uh, I, I read so somewhere. I don't want to tell that story anymore. You yeah. Said, yeah, that you sent out 10,000 emails and people were like, you were in the CIA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, my, my favorite moment. So so I literally sent out an email to all my friends saying, hey, um, I'm running, I'm running support for me. Yeah, click here. Give me $25. You know, that kind of stuff. And the the... I, a friend of mine was like, "Hey, let's go. Let's go have lunch tomorrow." I said, "Sure." We meet for lunch, and he literally goes, "What? Um, how was it at the farm?" And he uses the true name. So in in my nine and a half years, and even to date now, right? Even over eighteen years that I've been, you know, associated with the intelligence community, I've never used the true name of the farm. And I'm like horrified that he said it. And I was like, how did you know? How do you know that name? He goes, it's like in every book, right? In every <laughs> magazine article. And, and it was, it was one of those first things I learned. I was like, you know, sometimes when we're in the intelligence community, we're trying to protect things that, um, that guess what is already out there in the, in the public sphere. I have three clients who are former CIA. Yeah. And they've always been quiet about all of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So you, you you lost the first election. Mm -hmm. You then went to the private sector for a I period did. of time. Mm -hmm. Worked for the Crompton Group. Uh, worked at a cybersecurity company called Fusion X. Yep. What did they do? So so it started as an extension of Crumpton Group. We would help clients grow in markets they had never been in before. So a, a Mexican company would come to us and say, look, we've operated in Latin America for 75 years, but we're getting ready to buy a plant in the Philippines. What are those external factors that are going to impact our ability to make business decisions? And so we would help answer those questions. And uh, we were all basically at the time former CAA officers. And our clients came to us and said, hey, we're having some cybersecurity issues. And being good former CIA officers, we said, we know a guy. Um, and, and, I know a guy yeah, who knows know a guy. guy. Yeah. And so, so Matt DeVoe, uh, who has started a number of, of companies in cybersecurity, uh, we decided to start Crumpton Group. Uh, excuse me, it's Fusion X. And I was the person on Crumpton Group that was helping um, grow our, our client base. And so wh what we did, we basically broke into banks, stole their money, show them how we did it. We would mimic what would what we call APTs, advanced persistent threats. So the the baddest of the bad, right? The people that can get into any system. And guess what? We always got in. There was not one time that we were ever stopped from getting into um, a, a digital infrastructure. And so we would do that in order to find the vulnerabilities in a company's um, digital landscape and help them fix it. So if you're just an individual listening to this. Mm. Other than going off the grid and yeah. not being on the internet, how can an individual protect themselves? There's three things that you can do 
that will de- to protect you from like 87% of the threats out there. Have a password that is more than 14 characters. So not my last name. Not your last <laughs> name. Shouldn't be password. Okay. Password 1234 is still the number one password out there. The second most um, used password is password 12345. Um, <laughs> really? so, so don't use that. Okay. Um, use Note like, to self, change yeah, passwords. And, and look, on, on, and there's ways to do two-factor authentication in most logins now. So, you know, it, it, when you log into Google um, to get your email, you have to put in your password, but then it also sends you a text message, and you have to put, put those numbers in, in right? Mm-hmm. So, 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 14-character password doing two-factor authentication. The second thing is make sure all of your software is up to date. Make sure the apps on your phone has the latest software. Make sure whatever computer you use, the software, the, the programs you use, that that software is up to date, right? Um, that is, that is, goes a long way. That should just be automated, um, when you automated. do that, right? Yeah. So, so for example, if you use Microsoft Word, make sure it's the latest version of Word and that you have the security patches, right? Uh, a patch is when they're the, the company that owns the software files that there's a vulnerability, something wrong with the code that can be taken advantage of by a bad guy. Um, The patch is the code to fix that. And the third thing you do, do not click on emails from people you do not know they are from. (laughs) The prince that sent me the email that I just got a billion dollars. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Do not click on that, right? (laughs) And the the way – and look, it may look like it comes from a friend of yours. But the easiest way to look is if you have corresponded with somebody before – when that pops up, their actual name should pop up in the from line. If it's not a name and it's just an email address, then it is likely a, a fraudulent email. So do not click on emails from people you don't know. If you do those things, you can likely be yourself. safe. You can likely be safe. And cover your camera. And cover your camera, <laughs> yeah. Um, Want to shift gears a second. I want to compare how the average member of Congress, who the demographic, age demographic is older than mm-hmm. you are, how they use social media versus how you use social media. Um, so that's the general topic. Sure. But transitioning out of the CIA where you were not allowed to use it at all to now going into a very public existence. Sure. How was that transition? It was odd. I never said the three letters CIA for nine and a half years. Actually, no. I, I, you would tell – when you would recruit somebody, you would make sure they were very clear who they were actually working for. Okay. And you and you would say that, but that was – that was Not very often. That was a handful. Well, I was pretty good, so you know, I said it a few. You know, um, I'm, um, it was a lot. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, yeah, to, to where now I say it. I have to say those those three three letters fifty times a day, so so that was hard. Um, and and just knowing, just understanding the tools and how they worked, right? Like I didn't know, um, you know. I remember I, I hired this kid from UTSA to help me with my social media. We always and, hire the kid, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and he um, he was he he liked some pages. And I got people texting me, be like, I can't believe you're friends with so and so. I'm like, I don't even know who so and so is. Like, how is this working? And, and so, so understanding how the, the system works is really, I think, the difference between, um, some of the older members and the newer members. Um, I, I use social media to try to help people see kind of behind the scenes, right? And, and, and that is, uh, so that they, you know, and it's not always going to be my latest press release on HR 876, right? It's, you know, we were in the community helping this school on this particular project, right? Or now one of the things that I've enjoyed doing, we do a Friday trivia on Instagram. I, so, I want to come know, back to that because yeah. I have uh, a, at, some at, questions at, about that. At yeah. Hurt on the Hill, if yes. y'all want to follow yeah. me, at Hurt on the Hill, <laughs> H-U-R-D on the Hill. Um, and so so that is a way that we try to engage people in a, in a fun way 
on on the issues of the day. Now, I've read that both the Democrats and the Republicans have training for the members of Congress on how to use social media. Is that true? It, it, it's true. It's true. And, and, and some of it's basic, right? But we all know content is king, right? And so, so you have to generate good content. Um, we also have a lot of restrictions on how to use the paid functions of, of social media. So I cannot run digital ads on Facebook that has my face in it. Right. Um, on, on my official, you know, right. Congressman Will Hurt, which is my Hurt on the Hill account. So there are some restrictions that you can do that, that you have that are imposed so that it doesn't. So you're not using an official resource for electioneering. Now, you assumed office January 3rd, 2015. That's Trust correct. me, I looked at yeah, it. Okay, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, okay, gotcha, yeah, yeah. So you say. <laughs> yeah, so, so I say. say. Yeah. yeah. Spoken like a former CIA guy. Yeah. Okay. And does anybody ever really leave the CIA? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm an example of Rodney's okay. example. Okay, okay, just asking. Um, Rodney wouldn't give me a straight answer. Uh, your first Instagram post, again, you left January, or you took off of January 3rd. Your first Instagram post was January 15th. Okay. Uh, your you joined YouTube January twenty fourth. Okay. You joined Twitter in January. Mm-hmm. You joined Snapchat in January. Mm-hmm. These are all two thousand fifteen. Um, you embraced it immediately. Sure. Yeah, and and, and you got to remember, right? So so I ran in uh, 09 for the 2010 election, right? And so I lost in the primary. Texas, we have an early primary. So so we were using social media back then. And then when I was in the private sector, um, I started using it a little bit more personally. And then when we decided to run for the 14 cycle, which I believe we started in 13, um, you know, we started using that on the campaign. And the reason all those dates are 2015, those are my official, those are my official you know, congressman, yeah, congressman accounts. Yeah. Now, do you still have personal social media? I don't. So I don't. All on the official side. All on the official side. And I'm a big, in, I, I, I primarily uh, use Instagram. And and a lot of the times people are kind of shocked because I'm the one that will respond to them or I'm actually the one taking the pictures, yeah. right? And and so a lot of that. And then, and then I, you know, I, I haven't – my use of Snapchat has declined. Because I read early on where that was your your app of choice. Yeah, yeah. It, my, my use there declined a little bit um, be, because part of it is the back end of Snapchat for me. Um, if, if, if my goal is to try to interact with constituents – I want to make sure I'm interacting with constituents, and and, I, and things have changed since then. But but I, I literally exclusively uh, nobody on my team used uses Snapchat. It was it was all me. And then now you've transitioned to uh, Instagram. Mm-hmm. You talked about Friday trivia, yeah, uh, which some of them are really funny. Yeah, by the way, <laughs> look, it, it's uh, and and what's what's funny. I have a, a colleague of mine. Uh, from Texas, who hasn't gotten an answer wrong yet? Oh, really? So, so now we, 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 his name's John Ratcliffe. Now we have a special segment of Friday Trivia called Stump John Ratcliffe. And so <laughs> it's random, it's random questions that we're trying to. We're have you been able to, to stump him yet? Not yet, not, not yet. yet. After three tries, uh, and you have Find Your Park. Yeah, these are all stories that have been highlighted for sure. Uh, look, uh, so when I was a kid. We didn't go to national parks. We took one family vacation, and it was the Corpus Christi. And for my family the, vacation, why my one family my, vacation was to the mountains. Yeah, you know, and, and and it was something that that I didn't do. And now I represent eight national parks, and these are these are they're, they're amazing places that we should um, make. You know, they've been the National Park Service has been around for a hundred years. We want to make sure they're around for another hundred years. And we need to be doing, and, and I and I get on the park services and individual parks a lot. We need to be doing more to use current media, using new, new media to expose kids to those to encourage them to go. Um, I think with, with uh, the virtual reality technology that exists, uh, we should be having more immersive um, digital um, experiences at our national parks as a way to get people to show up. And, and we're starting to see an uptick in people attending our national parks. Is there any legislation on the horizon on virtual reality? There isn't, not, not virtual reality specifically. Um, but look, you know, when, when you look at artificial intelligence, which, which drives a lot of this, 
Um, what are going to be the ethics uh, around AI? How do we do basic research from the government? What is the, in the interconnectivity between us, between the federal government and the private sector? And how do we do this to, in order to, 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 um, um, win the competition with China, right? Because right. we should, we should be hoping that all the great companies involved in AI or that have to deal with 5G are American companies because you or, or are allies, because I'll tell you this, the Chinese are not developing facial recognition to make it easier for you to buy groceries at the grocery store. Right? They're using it in order to keep track and continue human rights abuses of their population. Uh, I want to transition back to China. In a second. Sure. Um, the last uh, social media site was Facebook, and you have a comments policy mm-hmm. that I love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am the guy that reads this. Stuff. Sure, sure. Uh, first, the... You ask for cooperation in keeping it a family-friendly forum, but then you have a do not feed the trolls policy. Yeah, uh, It is do not feed the trolls is a good rule to follow. And in general, our policy is not to engage unless we need to clarify incorrect information. Social media trolls and political trolls, how much is it the same thing? I, I think that they are the same thing. And, and what's, what's unfortunate is a lot of this stuff now is getting automated, uh, disinformation. I, I would put all of this in the broader disinformation category. And one of the, how do you deal with that, right? How do you know something is disinformation? And, and why people are nasty on, on social media, I, I just don't understand. Why people share information from folks they have no clue who they are. The example I always use, we all know, don't get into a car with a stranger. Now you got to put an asterisk on that now, unless it's an Uber or Lyft driver, right? <laughs> um, yes. So why are you sharing information from somebody you do not know? Uh, we all learned in kindergarten: if you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. Right. But on social media, it's like, but 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 people do that because that is what you know excites people. That's what generates activity, and and it's caustic and it's nasty. And unfortunately, I think that nastiness on social media is preventing social media from being that dialogue and that conversation and that two way street it was originally designed to be. Um. I want to ask you about – it was social media that thrust you into the national spotlight mm-hmm. to the extent that you're not a political junkie mm-hmm. and don't know the congressman from the 23rd District of Texas. But it was social media that thrust you into the national spotlight. It was a famous road trip with mm. Beto O'Rourke. Sure. When did that happen and how so, did it happen? So that happened – I think it was March. It was March uh, two years ago. Um so, so 17, 2017, yeah. you probably have it written down. And then did you, you, uh, did you, did you I, the I saw, yeah, I did. Yeah. You, you uh, rented a Chevy Impala. A Chevy Impala. <laughs> and, and so, so here's how it happened. At the time, Bet, so Beto and our, and my districts touch. I have part of El Paso. He has the other part. And he was the only Texan on the Veteran Affairs Committee. At the time, and number number of my veteran service organizations wanted to visit with someone on the uh, the VA committee, so I asked Beto to come down. He 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 was available, so we had three meetings that day. The first meeting, um, our flights get canceled back to DC. There was a major storm. It was like snowpocalypse number nineteen. Right, and I'm a I'm a loyal Southwest Airlines um, person. So if Southwest Airlines is canceling a flight. You know the weather is bad because Southwest flies in anything, all right? And the second meeting, Beto's like, let's drive back together. And third meeting, third event we were at together, I said, okay. And so that next morning, we went in a Chevy Impala and drove from San Antonio to Washington, D.C., 35-hour um, trip, 31 hours in the car, 29 hours live streams. So it, who drove? We traded. We traded. And look, at, at first, it, here's what was crazy. Um, at first, he drove and we were using his socials. So I'm riding shotgun and I'm the one reading the comments. And for the first 90 minutes, the comments were so nasty, directed at me. Because you're a Republican. Because I was a Republican. And look, you know, uh, Beto's followers are way more liberal than mine. Um, and so a- after 90 minutes, I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to. <laughs> Do this for another 30 hours. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then something changed. 
And people started being like, this is cool that y'all are doing this. I can't believe a Republican and Democrat can, can ride across the country together. And then the next day, and, and we switched off driving. The next day we were on my socials. And I started off driving, and he was reading the comments in the first 90 minutes. People Same thing. were like super nasty towards him. And after 90 minutes, it, it changed. And so, so yeah, so we and, and we look, we talked about healthcare for nine hours. Um, we we talked about every issue imaginable and, and took questions. And, and I saw you were interviewed by the national press. CBS mm-hmm. interviewed you. Mm-hmm. What were you using for a camera? Uh, our phones. It was just so. So he. And where were they mounted? On on the dash of the mm-hmm. on the dashboard of the of the car, and it was literally just he and I. Um, and then and then we stopped. We were having a hard time. Uh, so a lot of people were calling us, and we were kind of doing these impromptu interviews a- along the way, and we were having a hard time with the speaker on both of our phones. So we stopped. And got some Wi-Fi speaker at a Walmart <laughs> so that we can hear, so what we can people hear saying. people what people were saying. But yeah, and, and, but what the, the the thing that was funny, and and the thing that I remember is everybody would be like, you know, you shouldn't be watch looking at the phone while you're driving. You're like, I'm not driving. It's the other guy, right? Well, there because is one of the way, comments because yeah, are they driving while interviewing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was pretty. Where's your seatbelt? And so a lot of like, so we finally got to the point where we just like kept showing our seatbelts seat like every 15 minutes. But but here's a takeaway from the trip: way more unites us than divides us. Right? Um, we had 26 million people uh, watch us at some point in those in that 29 hours. And it was it was clear way more unites us and divides us as a country, and the country is ready for people to be able to disagree without being disagreeable, and and that was the two lessons I took away from that trip. I teased it earlier. I wanted to ask you about two political issues. Sure, we'll just sure. do a real not deep dive, but a quick sure, dive. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, border wall. You have more miles mm-hmm. of border than any other representative. Mm-hmm. In Congress, sure. Are you for a physical wall along the border? Building a thirty-foot-high concrete structure from sea to shining sea is the most expensive and least effective way to do border security. I've been saying that since two thousand and nine, and guess who finally agrees with me? Uh, the president. He said that recently. In some areas, a physical barrier makes sense, but in most of the areas, it doesn't. Um, in areas where border patrol's response time is measured in hours to days. <clears throat> A wall isn't a physical barrier. Someone's going to be able to jump over get it and get into the country. Exactly. And so we need technology. We need to be able to detect the threat and track that threat until we're able to deploy the most important men, the men and women in Border Patrol. But I will also add this. Right now, what's happening at the border is indeed a crisis. Um, you had 109,000 people coming to this country illegally just last month alone. All of last year, it was about 400,000. And 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 the the root causes of this is violence and lack of economic opportunities in the Northern Triangle. That's El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And so we need to be addressing those root causes. And I, I think we should we should have a special representative, a senior diplomat, dealing with that. Uh, also, we need to streamline legal immigration. At three point six percent unemployment, my hometown it's three point one percent. In the Permian Basin, it's two point zero percent unemployment. You, we need to streamline legal immigration, whether you're in agriculture or artificial intelligence, you need workers. And those are things we can be doing in order to make sure we're protecting our borders. Second political question. What's the biggest threat to long-term security in the United States? Uh, the, the, the greatest threat long-term is China, without a doubt. They are an existential threat uh, to our economy, to our way of life. By 2049, which is the 100-year anniversary of communism in China, the Chinese government is planning to surpass the United States of America as the leading world power. Uh, That's why they have continued to steal our technology. That's why they've continued to hack into American companies. That's why they've continued to to flaunt um, international agreements that they are they participate in. Um, They are trying to to be the dominant. Um, um, country on the planet, and people say, "Oh, they only care about their part of the world." Well, two years ago, they had they created their first military base outside of China. They did it in Djibouti, and if you look where Djibouti is, it's kind of an important part of where you know the, the how uh, 
international commerce goes back and forth through a number of straits and, and oceans in, in the, the North Africa and, and Middle East. Um, so, so they are without a doubt. Um, they are an authoritarian government who has an emperor who's going to be in power for the next 40 years. They can move all factors of production um, into uh, one direction in order to try to, to win, and they are, they are a threat. Again, completely shifting gears. Mm-hmm. If somebody wanted to get into politics, a young person wanted to get into politics, what advice would you give them? Get to have a job first. Have an expertise, right? The reason I've been able to be successful is because I had a previous career, and and I have opinions on those things, and I've been able to drill down on those issues. We talked offline several weeks ago about kissing babies. Mm-hmm. It was like shaking hands and kissing babies. Sure. Uh, is that really a thing? Yeah, it is. Look, I think the best part of the job is actually being out in the communities, right? I've done over, we, we've stopped having, we've stopped counting, but I've done over 5,000 public events. I've done 300 and something, uh, town halls. Um, part of the job is being out in the community and, and I represent 29 counties. So going out, talking to people, hearing what's going on, you learn a lot of stuff. And, and that's the fun part of the job. I'm always shocked by the number of, of, of elected officials that don't like people. Um, you shouldn't, you should like people because that's <laughs> it, the, helps, yeah, it helps. It helps. You know? It helps. Uh, want to get personal for a second. Sure. What's the question you get asked the most? Ooh, you know, so, so I, my, I try to, sp- I'm trying to speak in all of the schools in my district and elementary, middle and high school. And the first question after I speak, I always open up the Q and A. First question I always get, have you killed anybody? <laughs> and, and, and the answer is no. And I always say, if I had to pull my gun, my gun I'm pretty bad at my job. My, my job was to be sneaky. Right. And if you're having to pull a weapon, then, then you're not, you, sneaky you're not enough, being but... sneaky. Um, so that that's one. That, that, God, I'm trying to think of a. If I think of a, I think of one. Um, it like it, it it actually varies. It's whatever that issue of the day is, right? It may be roads. It may be you know their their family members in the military and they have a VA question but that's yeah. the that's the question i get a lot what tv channel doesn't exist that should Ooh. um i i wish i wish these are typical wall street journal questions by the way no absolutely <laughs> i'm trying to think personally what would i what would i like yeah right? what would you like um i'm so i love movies right and so i'll give you a chance to come i'll come back to that question yeah what's yeah. your favorite movie uh, my favorite movie. Well, you can't say favorite movie. I can tell you good ones, like 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 a bunch. Like I love Gladiator. If Gladiator's on. I'm gonna watch it. Um, I love Shakespeare in Love. Right. I think it's such a such a witty movie. Movie. I like Notting Hill. Right. Um, and and I I just recently watched uh, L.A. Confidential. Man, that's such a good movie. And then ultimately, I, I love Casablanca. Um, having lived overseas, I have a new appreciation for that for that movie. But Casablanca is a, is a really good one. So I'll come back to TV channel that should exist that doesn't. Uh, one that like was puts those movies on repeat. The old, you old know, movies, old yeah. old movies, old movies. What's yeah. your guilty pleasure? Ice cream, and I'm real simple too. I love vanilla ice cream. Right, I love <laughs> vanilla bean ice cream specifically, but that's my guilty pleasure. Or Eating a burger at the movie theater. Right? I, I I love I love being in a theater, and um, so yeah, those are the, those are the two things I do. What is something people would be surprised to learn about you? Surprised to learn about? Oh, shoot, look, I'm an elected official. It's like everything. In my Everything's background. out there. Everything in my background <laughs> has has been has been has been uh, combed over. Um, I think people don't know that like I still play basketball. Right, and I still I've been playing the same park um, since I was 13 years old. So we could go a pickup game. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever been starstruck? Y- yes, um, and it was um, it was a guy named Nate Howe. He's a he's a he's an author. He wrote a book called Generations. Um, uh, Neil Howe, excuse me, Neil Howe. And it was a book that I read when I was in high school. And, and they came, they're the ones that kind of came up with the term millennial and talks about, you know, the difference with Gen X and things like that. I just, it was a book that I thought was fantastic. And then when I, I met him, this was like early on when I first got to Congress, I was like, this wow. guy who I've been <laughs> reading is coming to my office. Uh, that was, that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, this is an apropos question because you're a lawmaker. Mm-hmm. If you could make one rule that everyone had to follow, 
doesn't have to pass. You just sure. make this rule. What would it be? It's simple. It's very simple. And it's a rule everybody's heard. And it is love thy neighbor like thyself. If we would, if we would follow that guidance, uh, the world would be a much better place. So what's ahead for you? But what's, what's ahead for me is, is you know, I, I, I represent one of the most challenging and competitive districts in, in the country. Uh, continue to get reelected, continue to work on, you know, I try to focus on issues that could solve real problems, right? I'm trying to work on a national strategy for, for artificial intelligence because this is what is going to dominate our future. The technological change we're going to see in the next 30 years is going to make the last 30 years look insignificant, and we have to be prepared for it. We have old laws. We have uh, legislative officials and leaders that don't understand these kinds of technologies, and this is going to hurt us, especially when you look at the great power competition uh, with China. So to continue to be able to stay focused on those issues. Last question. Where can people find you? Uh, Heard on the Hill. Is Twitter, you know, Instagram, Instagram, everything Facebook, is heard everything. on is heard, heard on the hill. H U R D. H U R D on the hill. Yeah. Well, thank you. Hey, thank you, buddy. Hey. That's it for this time. If you enjoyed our podcast, please write a review on iTunes and tell your friends to subscribe. If you have any questions about influencers or suggestions for future episodes, email them to John at Pfeiffer at Pfeifferlaw.com. Thank you for listening. 